Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning. This is the Philadelphia DA's office regular weekly press conference. We are delighted today to be hosted by our sheriff, Sheriff Rochelle Bilal, who has worked so closely with us on efforts to bring fugitives to justice and has had considerable success. Um, she is here to deliver a message. I won't, I won't repeat it, but it's a memorable message, and we look forward to that. If you notice some of us wearing this pin, this orange pin, that is because this month is National Gun Violence Awareness Month, which I have been reminded by uh, the chief of our Victim Witness Services Unit, the Reverend Myra Maxwell. And so you may see some of us wearing that. I want to say just up front, as a preliminary matter, we are not able to provide details at this point on the police-involved shooting, I should say the trooper-involved shooting, which occurred over the weekend on I-95. Um, I have directed the DAO's Victim Support Services Division to work with internal and external victim services agencies to provide support to the family of the young man who died in that incident, 18-year-old Anthony Allegrini. The DAO Special Investigations Unit is working collaboratively in the investigation of that incident, which is our obligation. We are required, of course, to do that, and we continue to gather information in relation to it. I should tell you also, for those of you who are following this story, that the DA's office will be joining state police later today for a press conference with more information regarding the investigation. Although I do not have it confirmed, I believe that will be about 2 o'clock, and I believe it will be at the Belmont State Trooper Barracks. What I hope will not get lost in the discussion of the specific facts and their consequences of what happened, what I hope will not get lost is how dangerous drifting is, how dangerous street racing is, how unacceptable it is to all of the law-abiding people who live and work in the city of Philadelphia, and how we all have to work proactively to find ways to prevent this kind of activi activity from occurring in the first place. I can tell you I've been in on a number of very specific meetings with law enforcement over the last few years, and they're in a tough spot. It's a very, very difficult situation when people are bringing mayhem to the streets by speeding through it without regard for the safety of others, it's a very difficult situation for police to do anything that will not make it even more dangerous. Putting aside the specifics, and we will know more of those specifics in the near future, putting that aside, I hope no one will lose sight of the reality that this kind of street racing conduct, this kind of drifting is a constant danger and it is a constant threat to Philadelphians that needs to end. We are here today for the usual reasons. Uh, number one, to talk about gun violence data during the past week or so. And number two, to talk about a specific topic. That specific topic will be the third in a sequence of four press conferences we do around fugitives. Fugitives from homicide matters. We have focused on some other sections of the city. Today we will, will be focusing on the Northwest. And among the five fugitives we will be discussing is one of the people who was involved in the mass shooting that occurred at Roxborough High School that ended the life of a 14-year-old. We will be talking about him. Sadly, that was not his only homicide. He's also wanted for a second homicide that occurred within a period of just a few days. We will get to that shortly. I do want to recognize and acknowledge some people who are here, though. We have the Honorable Carolyn Engel Temin, First Assistant. We have First Assistant Robert Listenby. We have Sheriff Rochelle Bilal, who is here and is kindly hosting us again, uh, who has been an excellent partner with us from the very beginning. We have ADA Joanne Pescatore, the supervisor of the DAO's Homicide Non-Fatal Shooting Unit. Reverend Myra Maxwell is here, Executive Director of the DAO's Victim uh, Support Services Division. I'm happy to see my old colleague, Tariq El Shabazz, here. It's always good to see you. Did I miss anybody? No, I didn't. Um, 
thank you all for being here. Turning to gun violence numbers, we continue to have a terrible situation with gun violence. Uh, we continue to see a little bit of encouraging improvement, but we have an awful lot of work to do. As of today, by which I mean 11.59 p.m. on June the 4th, there were 177 homicides year to date, 177. Last year, it was 214. The year before that, it was more. We are actually 37 fewer homicides as compared to last year, 48 fewer homicides as compared to two years ago. This represents currently a moderate decrease of 17%, and last year, the full year decrease was about 8%. Obviously, these numbers represent people. Any murder is unacceptable. We are in no way satisfied with this progress. But we also are here to tell the truth. And the truth is that there is some progress. Um, if you look, as I do, at the PPD's publicly available uh, dashboard, what you will see is not only these reductions in homicides, you'll see that according to PPD, there is a reduction in shootings, all shootings. That is about 17%. There is a reduction in the number of victims of shootings. That is also about 17%. So um, what we can say is certainly this is better than if it was going up 17%, and that we should all be encouraged to even greater efforts through prevention, through modern enforcement, by locating and bringing to justice these fugitives. We should be encouraged that perhaps we can make a difference and improve the situation. During the prior week, and this data refers to May the 26th through June the 1st, there were nine homicides, 29 non-fatal shootings. From May the 26th through June the 1st, there were 141 gun-related incidents, 141. Of those 141, there were 76 arrests made by law enforcement resulting in 75 cases being opened and charged by the DA's office. Cash bail fails us again, but I guess I'll just keep saying that until Pennsylvania's legislature actually wants to do better. We have three shootings in particular that I was going to reference. The first one is a non-fatal shooting incident that occurred on Saturday, June the 3rd in the intersection of Broad Street and Susquehanna Avenue in the 22nd Police District at about 9.54 p.m. An approximately 21-year-old black male was shot once in the head and once in the shoulder. He was transported to Temple Hospital and placed in stable condition. No arrest has been made by PPD. This investigation is ongoing, and anyone with information should contact PPD's shooting investigation group. Now, all three of these incidents are being investigated by the shooting investigation group, and therefore I'll say this telephone number now, but it applies to all three of these cases. If there's anyone out there with impl information, please contact the PPD shooting investigation group at 215-686-8270. The second shooting incident is a non-fatal double shooting, which occurred Sunday, June the 4th, in the 2800 block of Cotman and the 15th Police District at about 1.54 a.m. Two victims were shot. Victim number one, a 38-year-old black male, was shot once in the forearm and once in each knee. He was transported by private vehicle to Nazareth Hospital and placed in stable condition. Victim number two, a 16-year-old black male, was shot in the left hip and transported by the same private vehicle as victim number one to Nazareth Hospital and listed in stable condition. Please come forward if you have that information. The third incident. It's a non-fatal shooting incident that occurred on Saturday, June the 3rd in the 5400 block of Walker Street in the 15th Police District at about 10.44 p.m. An approximately 17 to 19-year-old white male was found suffering from a gunshot wound to the head and a broken ankle. He was transported to Jefferson Frankfurt Toursdale Hospital where he was placed in critical but stable condition. No arrest has been made by PPD once again for all three of these incidents. Anyone with information, please come forward. The number is 215-686-8270. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce the Reverend 
Myra Maxwell, who is, of course, the chief of our Vic Victim Support Services Division, a division that includes our CARES unit, which works specifically and intensively with families of homicide victims. Reverend Maxwell uh, reminded me that this, na this is National Gun Violence Awareness Month and may have a comment on that as well. Reverend Maxwell. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, D.A. Krasner. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, June being Gun Violence Awareness Month. This was established in 2015, and they also have what we call Wear Orange Day, which actually occurred on June 2nd. Uh, this was created in honor originally of Hadia Pendleton and all survivors and victims of gun violence nationwide. That includes all of us here in Philadelphia who are impacted by gun violence, uh, although some may be um, co-victims of homicide, or even those who have just been shot, as the DA mentioned, a few shootings on this weekend. The impact of gun violence has a very lasting effect on families. A lot of times when we think of the impact of uh, gun violence, we think more, mainly of the co-homicide survivors, meaning the parents, the grandparents, but we also have to think about the children because the children are ab absolutely impacted by gun violence. It does have a lasting effect because our children, we want them to grow to be strong and healthy, but many of them are going to schools and unable to concentrate because of the impact gun violence has had on their particular lives. We also have to remember that not just those who are direct family members, but their indirect members also impacted. Those indirect members are the great-grandparents, the grandparents. They may not be as close, but they're impacted. Also, the co-workers and the colleagues and all of those people that people know, we're all impacted. And one of the things that we have to consider is all of us really want justice. When there's uh, cases that aren't cleared immediately, there are services and supports for all of you. I can speak for my, from my own perspective because I, too, am a co-homicide survivor. So therefore, when these cases happen, we want justice. We want to see justice happen. But we also want the support of community, the support of organizations that can be there to help us through this process, although it is very difficult. The help that we need is, one, we need people to realize that it's important that you help us get that justice. And we also want to make sure that you know that, yes, there are organizations that are going to be there. One is our district attorney's office. We have victim assistance officers in every police district. We have community-based organizations that are there to provide much-needed support for families during this very, very, very critical time. I encourage you, if you are a co-homicide survivor, if you are a family member of someone who's been impacted by gun violence, please make sure that you get the services that are available. There are services that are free for you. There's no cost but for you to just ask for them. We're here to do that for you, and we want to do that for you. So please contact us at the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office. You can reach us by phone, which is 215-686-8027, 215-686-8027. Or you can go to our website. You can reach us uh, through our website at phillyda.org. That's phillyda.org. And we will put you in contact with the community-based partners, our law enforcement partners, to make certain that you receive the services in which you so richly deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Reverend <clears throat> Maxwell. Uh, I have a message for those of you who have been victims or family members of victims or survivors of gun violence, and that is that you are not forgotten. I have a message for people tempted to be involved in shooting, in gun violence, and that is that we are watching, we are investigating, we are working very closely with all of our law enforcement partners, and we are after swift and just consequences for those of you who engage in this behavior. Put the gun down. Get away from the gun and don't go back. And as for the public, all of us who are affected but not as directly involved with the gun violence that we are experiencing, experiencing, let's be clear, 
Our families, our city, our babies deserve safe streets during the summer months, and we are going to work diligently on focused modern enforcement and on prevention of the type that can make a real difference and continue to push us in a more positive direction in relation to reducing gun violence in this city. We are here now to highlight five fugitives from the northwest section of Philadelphia who are wanted for homicides committed since 2021. I want to affirm once again the excellent work that is done by the Homicide Non-Fatal Shooting Unit under the leadership of ADA Joanne Pescator, who will be speaking in a moment about these fugitives. This was actually her idea um, that we would work with PPD in order to highlight certain fugitives, and it is an idea that has shown some success. A number of the faces and names that have been put out there in the last press uh, conferences are now the faces and names of people who are behind bars and have do at least in part to some of these efforts and due to the co cooperation of the public uh, have been brought to face justice as a consequence. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce ADA Joanne Pescator who will run through these fugitives and make some other comments and after that I'll come back up to introduce our sheriff who has some important comments to make as well. Thank you DA Krasner, uh, good morning. Uh, we're going to highlight five actual uh, fugitives that are currently wanted, um, and I want to thank the DA publicly for allowing us to do this, and I want to thank the uh, homicide uh, detectives who are helping me uh, along this way. The first fugitive I'm sure you're all very familiar with is Dayron Bernie Thorne. Mr. Bernie Thorne was only 16 uh, when the Roxboro incident happened. He is actually wanted for two separate uh, murders. The first murder was the murder of Tamir Jones, a 19-year-old male, which happened on Monday, September 26th of 2022, in the afternoon outside of 641 North 13th Street here in Philadelphia. Mr. Jones was shot um, on the highway. He suffered multiple gunshot wounds, and he was later pronounced. A warrant was obtained for Mr. Bernie Thorne uh, for this case on November 3rd of 2022. The next day, Mr. Bernie Thorne participated in the murder of 14-year-old Nicholas Alizadi. Uh, that's the Roxborough High School shooting. As you all know, four individuals, other individuals, have already been arrested on this case. They've all been held for court as we speak. Mr. Bernie Thorne is the last one that's still out there. On Tuesday, September 27th at 4.41 p.m., Officers responded to Roxborough High football field, 4700 Peachin Street, where five shooting victims were located. Uh, Mr. Bernie Thorne, a warrant was issued for him on October 3rd of 2022. If anyone knows where he is or has any information or has any information on any of these fugitives, please call the homicide unit at 215-686-3433 or call one, uh, excuse me, 215-686-TIPS, or go online, philliesmostwanted.org, and submit your information anonymously. The second person is Kyrie Dennis, and a lot of you are probably very familiar with this case as well. This involved the shooting death and robbery of James Watson, a 69-year-old male who was at an ATM on March 3rd of 2022 at 8.21 p.m. That was at Germantown and Shelton Avenue. He was at the Citizens Bank located on Germantown Avenue. A uh, One male has already been arrested for this case, Corey Thompson. This male is out there and a warrant was issued for him on April 21st of 2022. The next male is Shafiq Lewis. Unfortunately, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis's victim is also a 13-year-old boy. Marcus Stokes, 13 years old, was gunned down on Friday, October 8th of 2021, outside of his school, the 3100 block of North Judson Street. A warrant was approved for Mr. Lewis on October 21st of 2021. We're coming up on almost uh, 
two years for that warrant. If anyone has any information about this case, please, I'm sure Marcus Stokes' parents want justice as well. The next fugitive, the next fugitive is John Taylor. Mr. Taylor is wanted for shooting two people. On August 26th of 2022, at 450 West Nidro Avenue here in Philadelphia, the victim in this case, Deshaun Gay, was inside of a car where he was uh, suffered multiple gunshot wounds and he was later pronounced. There was also a female uh, who was in that car, was also shot. A warrant was issued uh, on 11-23 of 2022 for Mr. Taylor. Again, any information, please call the numbers or go online and submit your information anonymously. The last uh, fugitive is Alejandro Tilly. Mr. Tilly is also wanted for the shooting death of George Green, a 66-year-old male who was gunned down on May 30th of 2022 at 4.48 a.m. in the 14th Police District, 5700 Anderson Street. Uh, Mr. Green was found to be suffering from a gunshot wound to the chest. Any information that you have on any of these, please call 215-686-TIPS or again the Homicide Unit, 215-686-3433. Thank you. Thank you, ADA Pescatore. If anyone out there has information on these people, let's get them in. Bottom line here is the public is safer once they are in. They are safer once they are in, and our law enforcement partners are safer once they are in. Let's get them in. Let's take care of the situation. I don't know that anyone has been more effective in communicating what I just said poorly than Sheriff Rochelle Bilal. I have been hearing from people for two weeks who keep repeating her words. I'm not going to steal her lightning or her thunder or anything else. Um, but I know the sheriff. I know her very well. I know what an excellent partner she has been, how much she cares about gun violence, and how much she cares about bringing these fugitives to justice. And I will let her do one of the many things she does best of all, and that is speak for herself. Good morning. First of all, we are here with the DA's office and all our law enforcement partners to just reach out to the community to basically say that we need your help. We need your help. Everybody has to go to sleep somewhere. Everybody eats somewhere. Everybody has a family member of all of these fugitives. And we're saying to you, what you don't want, you don't want this smoke coming up in your house. If they there, if they eating there, if they sleeping there, you do not want this smoke coming up in your house. Turn them in. You will be safer, they will be safer, the community will be safer, and the law enforcement professionals all around the city will be safer. We got a summer coming up. We don't want to see another person shot or hurt. And if they have already shot, they will, not, they, they will not hesitate to shoot again. So as we keep pleading to the communities at large, all your cousins, all your brothers, all your friends, all your grandma, Nana, DD, whoever you call them, turn them in. Because you don't want this smoke up in your house. <clears throat> Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, at this time, we are going to turn <coughs> to questions. Uh, please try to make your questions connected to the topic of this press conference. Getting at information of benefit to the public is actually the point of these gatherings, and thank you all for being here. Uh, we will give everyone an opportunity to ask a question. First of all, we have from the Tribune, Abdul Suleiman. Nothing? All right. Thank you, sir. WTXF, George Roach. No? Okay. 6ABC, Rich Lacovara. Yep. Did I mess it up? Lacovara. 
Like so a Vera, okay. So my question involves the homicide clearance rate. Right. So it's up this year, I think 63% compared to 48% last year. Do you have a reason you attribute that to, like what's going on? Well, um, I've certainly we can have Joanne Pescator speak about it, but there's some, some things that are a little complicated that I need to mention as long as we are there. The clearance rate is calculated in an interesting way. It is possible to have a 200% clearance rate. It is possible to have a 250% clearance rate because what they do mathematically, and this is how it's always been done, it's done here consistently with other locations, is they look at the number of cases that are solved this year regardless of when those homicides occurred. They might have occurred yesterday, they might have occurred six years ago. And they count all of those as solved cases. And then they compare that number to the number of homicides that have occurred just this year, okay? So we've got cases from whenever that are solved this year being compared just to the cases that occur this year. So you can end up with some situations where the data is a little unusual. Let's say it's January and there have been 15 homicides this year, but actually after a lot of work for years, there have been 30 homicides solved in January. You can have a 200% clearance rate. So I say that just to give context. Any indication that a clearance rate is on the way up, so long as we're getting the right people, and I believe that PPD is doing uh, an excellent job of being careful and trying to get the right people, anything like that is positive. Uh, it is also worth pointing out that clearance rate for homicides and clearance rate for gun homicides are different things. Clearance rate for gun homicides is generally lower all over the country for some pretty obvious reasons. Uh, some, of the, some of the homicides that are the most straightforward, the tragic domestic violence murders where the perpetrator actually picks up the phone and says, I killed my spouse. Some of those are not a whodunit, tragic and horrible though they are. So that is not the nature of most gun homicides. Most gun homicides are being done by people for reasons that are not obvious, people who do not pick up the phone and say, come and get me, I just did it. They are more difficult to solve. So having said all of that, uh, I do think that I do want to hear what ADA Pescador has to say, but I think that there was a smart move uh, a while ago to have more detectives, and that has helped. I think it is also the case, and there's pretty clear criminological evidence of this, that when you have more and more homicides, you can't just instantly invent more and more detectives. No matter how hard they work, and they work incredibly hard, it is not the case that they can magically double the number of cases that they solve. So as a homicide rate comes down, they're less overwhelmed, they're more able to do an excellent job on each case, and I think, uh, I think that is helping. I can tell you there are also some pilots underway, investigative pilots, in which we have been in discussions that I think are very positive, having to do with forensics, and we may see some benefits coming from that. Um, but beyond that, I would say it's good news. We're happy to see it, and I will let ADA Pescator address it as well. Thank you, Dave Krasner. Um, I, as the supervisor of that particular unit, all I know is I see them clearing job after job after job. I know um, from being on call, I was on call last week, um, the detectives bring jobs to me. They work relentlessly. When I tell you relentlessly to recover video, they don't stop. They go block after block after block. They knock on doors. They go to businesses. They get search warrants. They do whatever they need to do. And I feel like the clearance rate has gone up uh, because of all of that work, because of videos, because people actually give them videos, send them videos, forensics. All of that work um, helps because some of these cameras out there are unreal. You can actually see the shooting. You can pick the person out yourself, even if you don't know them. But I want to give a shout out to those detectives because the summer months are coming and I'm sure they're going to be overworked and, and there's nothing they can do about it, but just keep up the good work and uh, please, if you have any information on any homicides, please help them out. Give them whatever information you have. You may not even know that what you know is something they may need to bring a case in. Thank you. KYW, Kristen Johansson. Uh, yeah, first for Joanne, do we know um, where or do the authorities know at all where Bryce Warren may be or like what states he may have been in? And 
No, um, and it, you know, it just baffles me that a 16-year-old person could be out there like this, uh, clearly getting help from others. Um, we've had sightings. We've had, I've done a numerous search warrants myself uh, for different states. I don't want to state where that is. I know the fugitive squad from the homicide unit and the federal authorities are helping us on this case. Um, nothing. So if you know where he is, his mother, his brother, whoever, please call. This is the last person that needs to be brought in on that rock star case. And similarly with um, kind of with what happened with Amy Hurst, in the Amy Hurst's case, uh, I believe that the brother was charged after the fact. Is that maybe something that the government can explore and people who may know where he is or maybe helping him hide could possibly face charges? Sure. Uh, if I had my way, every person that helped anybody escape these kind of charges would be charged with something. Um, and I'm not beyond asking the DA to do that. If the evidence is there, and clearly it's a 16-year-old person that's been on the run for quite a while. Somebody's helping him hide him somewhere. Okay. Um, and then just a question, not regarding necessarily what happened on 985, but you did touch on it briefly, DA. Um, when it comes to just kind of, I guess, there was some chaos up in the Northeast with um, some kids. Do you have any kind of comment generally Sure. Uh, certainly. You know, obviously we want the state, the streets to be as safe as they can possibly be. And to the extent that the Philadelphia Police Department and our law enforcement partners are able to bring us solid cases, we're going to bring charges. That's, that's where it stands. Um, now, I say that, but I also need to say that especially when we are talking about things like drifting or we are talking about sort of flash activity that happens all at once, where it's very hard to identify exactly who was there and people scatter quickly, that's a challenge. That is very hard. I don't care what police department or what law enforcement entity you're talking about, it's tough. Uh, you know, with or without full staffing, it's very difficult. But to the extent that we are provided with that information, we're given a defendant, we're given an identified defendant, we have a solid case that establishes probable cause and the possibility of success, we absolutely are going to do that and you know going back to your other question we don't have any patience for people who are deliberately concealing killers that is a crime and if anybody's in that position there are occasions when family members who frankly as uh, the sheriff said don't want to be a part of that find themselves in a predicament well it's time to pick up the phone and get yourself out of that predicament and let's address this situation, bring it to justice in the way that is safest for everybody and is not going to put relative and loved ones in harm's way because, yes, we absolutely will charge them with crimes and we absolutely will pursue the, the prosecution of those crimes. All right, uh, John Leonard, WPHL 17. Um, no, sir? Okay. Uh, NBC 10, Rosemary Connors. Two, two questions. Um, Sure it is, um, and as you know, as soon as the, we get on to somebody, they move on. So, you know, the information is only as good as fast as we can get it, and we do have the feds helping us as well, who have a lot more resources and a lot more uh, time to help us and can spread themselves out all over the country. So they have been a great um, help in this particular case, and I'm just confident that after today, somebody who's watching this feel some kind of way for this mother that justice for the last person that's left out there on this particular case. Um, and then real quickly, DA Krasner, obviously we'll wait until the two o'clock press for more details on uh, what happened on I-95, but um, I'm wondering if you can speak to, oftentimes when we see 
see these kinds of illegal uh, incidents crop up, law enforcement puts together task force, maybe task forces to try to combat them. I, I know, as you said, you've been working with other agencies, going to police reports. You have meetings for months, um, if not years, over this kind of issue. Is that a possibility that there may be a task force forming, um, certainly in the wake of what just happened on I-95? I mean, yes, there was a shooting, but also these people blocking a major highway Sure. So there have been multiple meetings over a period of years having to do not only with the drifting activity, the street racing activity, but also uh, with ATVs and with unregistered uh, dirt bikes and the serious problem. All of that activity is causing. I think every one of those meetings has been positive. It has involved a wide array of law enforcement personnel. Um, and I want to give credit in particular to Joel Dales, who I think has done extraordinary things to try to figure out what is possible to do without making the situation worse. Um, is that a task force? I don't know. I mean, I know that we're all working together real hard. I know that, and I know that we have been for a long time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mike Gray. Nothing, sir? Okay. Rodrigo Torrejon from the Enquirer. Hi, Jim. Um, just curious, uh, is there anything in terms of detail or information that you can share on the incident stuff? So, particularly when it comes to kind of reconciling some of what trends are trying to run, uh, how the community is feeling, and uh, the reporting that's been going from those state and local law officials. I don't want to get ahead of the. Um, State Troopers. Uh, we will not only be attending the press conference, but we will have some basic comments. The most important thing for us to do, because we are an independent entity investigating the situation, the same way we investigate every officer-involved shooting involving, involving the Philadelphia police, or you know, even at one point we had a shooting involving the head of the FBI. Uh, our allegiance is to the truth. We'll figure out what it means in terms of consequences later. But our allegiance is to the truth, and we got to make sure this investigation is done right. I can tell you that we want the public, we want the, all the public, to get us any videos that they have, any witness information that they have. We are certainly familiar with, with what's already available to the public. Uh, but it's important that we know exactly what happened and exactly what did not happen. In this case, just like it's important in any other case, we have to figure out what the truth is, and I would be getting ahead of the state troopers, but also getting ahead of our investigation if I were to offer more specific opinions. I can tell you, though, this is, this is front of mind. The first thing I did this morning was go over certain kinds of evidence that are available. Um, what I know for sure is we want all the evidence that's out there. We know we haven't seen all of it yet, and that we will be as careful as we can possibly be and as even-handed as we can possibly be in drawing uh, and figuring out the facts and drawing legal conclusions based upon those facts. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cipriano, big trial. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Krasner, you failed to endorse a mayoral candidate or the sheriff. Is that because polling from candidates showed that you were toxic, sir? And that an endorsement from you or a joint appearance with you would have been detrimental to the campaign? Sir, this is an official press conference where we don't actually get heavily into political things. Uh, I can say that you have not disappointed. Once again, your facts are scrambled. But having said that, I'm not going to have a political discussion uh, in a context where the event has been set up by city workers who are not permitted to participate in politics. Do you have a question that has anything to do with the topic of this press conference? Sir, I just want to make a general objection here. Elected officials... I didn't ask if you had an objection. I said, do you have a question? That I relates have a question. Yes. It's what is that sheriff. question? I have a question for the sheriff. Okay. You want the question? If it's political, we can't answer it. Why not? Because this is an official press conference. And you can't discuss politics? No. They have, uh, please go on our website, the political website, RochelleBalal.com, and reach out to their professional team. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much.